The Billionaire CEO's Runaway Wife Written by E.T. Watson Narrated by Daniel Cuddy, Celia Stone, Lucy Topps, and Jim Swanson Chapter 1 I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the bride. The priest intoned in a monotonous voice. Sarah turned, blushing, as she faced her husband for the first time. It was done. They had said the words and stood in front of their families, so now it was true. Gazing upon her husband, she found his expression emotionless and indifferent. With a sigh, he leaned forward to kiss her cheek. Sarah woke and slowly sat up. She sat there several moments before looking over at the other side of the bed to find it empty as it had been for the past three years. With a sigh, she stood and quietly made her way to the bathroom, stepping into the shower. Three years ago, she married her Prince Charming, or so she had thought. Lucas Stanton was the grandson of Alice Stanton, one of the most prominent business people in New York. Despite being a woman, Alice succeeded in a male-dominated world and was known as the first lady of business, standing on even ground with the likes of Augustus de Clare, Richard Prescott, and Emerson Carlyle. Her own son proved inept at business, so Alice maintained the reins of her company until her grandson showed promise. She groomed him to be her heir and the next head of Stanton Incorporated, skipping over her own son in an unprecedented move. However, the changing of the guard came with a price. She insisted Lucas marry, and not just to any woman, but a woman of her choosing. Alice's last acquisition was Tomlinson Tech, the company Sarah's father started, brought out of obscurity and drove to bankruptcy. For as long as Sarah could remember, her father had been fascinated by gadgets and electronics. He was a fair programmer, so starting a technology company seemed to be a surefire way of earning his fortune. But good with computers did not translate to business smarts. Poor management led to the company's inevitable demise, but her father refused to submit and went to other companies, wanting them to buy out Tomlinson and secure the funds he needed to maintain his lifestyle. Most turned him down outright, but Alice Stanton humored him. They finally settled on a deal, giving Sarah's father 10% over the company's market value, several shares in Stanton Incorporated, and a bride for Lucas. Sarah couldn't believe her father when he delivered her the news. She denounced the deal, but a private interview with Alice herself changed Sarah's mind, so she agreed to the arrangement, though she at least secured herself some conditions. According to what she heard, Lucas also balked at his grandmother's deal, but in the end acquiesced to her demands to ensure his position as company CEO. Sarah didn't know if he had gotten any conditions out of his grandmother, as she did, but she supposed it didn't matter. The wedding was set. It had always been Sarah's dream to have an autumn wedding, but her father insisted on a spring event, to secure the deal as soon as possible, as he wouldn't receive his money until after the official I do's. He left Sarah to plan and make the arrangements, all the while cutting an already limited budget once a venue was secured. Luckily, getting by with limited funds was nothing new. In fact, it had been her mother's specialty. While her father's passion was technology, her mother's had been antiquing, finding the potential in beauty in something old, reviving it, and making it new again was her calling, and Sarah learned how to do it at her side. 
There wasn't a garage sale, thrift store, street fair, or flea market her mother passed up in her quest, and the same passion lived on in Sarah. With her shrinking budget, Sarah decorated the church and reception hall on her own, making the repurposed look chic and sophisticated. That also included dress, which was really her mother's old wedding gown, although her friend Vicky handled most of the altercations. Despite her efforts in the exclusive guest list, it seemed she had not impressed her groom or high society. Of the few reviews she read, all were of the opinion she fell well short of the Stanton's reputation. She could bear society's criticism. It was her husband's open dismissal that hurt. During the reception, he danced with her only once and never even looked her in the eye the entire night, which, she supposed, was more than her father or brother did. After dinner, a limo took them to their new villa, a wedding gift from Alice, located in Astoria. Lucas preceded her to the door, barely holding it open for her as she stepped inside their new home for the first time. Giving her the keys, he turned back to the door. Here you are, then. Have a good night. A what? Sarah blinked. Oh, what do you mean, aren't you... You honestly think I'm staying here? He scoffed. I have a condo downtown. Why would I stay here? But... Lucas laughed. You thought this was an actual marriage? It's a stunt. A show. Concocted by my grandmother. It means nothing. With that, he left. And she was alone. And that was how her marriage began. In the three years they had been married, Sarah rarely saw her husband, except when he needed to make a public appearance. Only then, he'd tell her to secure a car and meet him at the venue. She was expected to trot out on his arm like a trained pony. When he was tired of her presence, he sent her off on her own with instructions not to embarrass him before she headed home, alone. It wasn't any wonder she grew paler over the years and lost several pounds, lacking any appetite. They never went out to eat and never had a simple conversation. In fact, he made no effort to engage her or learn anything about her. Though they were always careful to maintain the image of the happy couple, high society was adept at reading their subtle cues. As Lucas Stanton's wife, she should have received numerous invitations to various functions and events, but aside from a few sent from friends, society ignored her with the same disdain as her husband. All of that she could live with. It was the other thing that tore her heart to pieces. Stepping out of the shower, she wrapped herself in a towel and stepped into the bedroom to hear her phone alert her to a new message. Clenching her jaw, she walked over to the bed and glanced at the sender. Madeline. Taking a deep breath, she set the phone down, refusing to open the message. Madeline Rogers was the childhood friend of Lydia Stanton, Lucas's sister. She grew up with the Stanton siblings and was practically joined at their hips. As such, Lucas gave her a job as a secretary but Sarah was well aware their relationship was much closer. Madeline never wasted a day reminding her how good Lucas treated her or how many times he made her orgasm during their illicit meetings. Sarah had stopped reading the texts long ago, but they came every morning, like clockwork. And Madeline's weren't the only messages. Her phone chimed twice more as it received messages from Lydia and her mother, Patricia. Sarah didn't read theirs either. They were always the same. Lydia's message would demand to know why she was still getting in the way of Lucas and Madeline's love and happiness. At the same time, 
Patricia would ask why Sarah hadn't simply killed herself, yet given how easy it would be with various household items. Sarah's personal favorite had been when Patricia suggested using the kitchen knife set her mother-in-law gifted them as a wedding present. Their messages Sarah could ignore. It was harder when she had to see them in person. Thankfully, these moments were few and far between. The only time Sarah had to see them was on the holidays at the Stanton estate. There, at least. Alice's presence curbed their antics, since neither would risk upsetting the Stanton matriarch, who was always friendly with her, while she was nothing more than an annoyance to Lucas. She was clearly Alice's favorite. But Alice couldn't be everywhere, and Lucas never defended her. Dressing in jeans and a sweater, Sarah headed to the kitchen. There, she filled a kettle with water and set it on the stovetop to boil. When she first moved into the villa, there had been a housekeeper, but she tired of the other woman's looks of pity and eventually dismissed her with a generous severance pay and glowing references. Sometimes she missed having the other woman to talk to, but the house was small enough for her to care for her on her own, especially considering she only used three rooms and left the rest locked up. When the kettle whistled, Sarah took it off the burner and poured herself a cup. After some consideration, she selected her tea for the day and headed to the table. Opening her laptop, she sipped her tea while it loaded. Once it was running, she opened her latest file and read where she last left off. I woke to the welcome scent of musk and old spice. Opening my eyes, I gazed upon the visage of the man who had gotten a hold of my heart. A five o'clock shadow softened his chiseled jaw and his wavy brown hair flopped enticingly over his forehead. My hands itched to run through it, but I didn't want to wake him. Quietly, I slipped out of bed, covering my naked body with his shirt before padding out of the bedroom. After all these years... I had come to accept my looming spinster status, so this romance was unexpected. Yet there was something intriguing about this man. He captivated me like no other, and it was clear he felt the same about me, judging by the way his gaze always followed me. In fact, he almost gave away our game during our stakeout at the underground gambler's den, but luckily, he was as good in a fight as he was in bed. My body shivered at the mere thought of his touch and lingering kiss. Shaking my head, I went to the kitchen to prepare my customary morning pot of tea, turning on my television to distract my devious mind. As I sat her on the couch, I sipped my chamomile tea and watched the news. In other news, Prince Edward announced his long-awaited engagement to Princess Margaret. The handsome pair greeted guests at the royal estate last Tuesday to confirm their impending nuptials. The teacup slipped from my hand, shattering on the floor as I stared at the image on the screen. It was Edward. My Ed. There was no doubting my eyes. My Ed was a prince, and he was engaged. How? How had my intuition been so wrong? How could he use me like this? And what was this? Some final fling before his big day? Calm yourself, Rosemary. It has to be a mistake. Right? Despite my attempts to explain away the reality before my eyes, there would be no denying it. My Prince Charming was an actual prince. He also belonged to someone else. So what then was I supposed to do? Sarah leaned back in her chair as she stared at the query. Yes. What then was she supposed to do? Since Sarah was young, she had two passions in life antiquing with her mother, and writing. Throughout her childhood, she always had a notebook handy to fill whenever inspiration struck her. She couldn't now pinpoint the exact moment Rosemary Thomas had been conceived, but she remembered writing one adventure after another, slowly refining her heroine. Rosemary had gone through several incarnations, a fairy princess, a pirate ship captain, even a cyborg in one strange outing, before Sarah crafted her into the psychic medium 
tarot card reading investigator she was today. Readers delighted in Rosemary's search for truth and justice, currently spanning six books. When she was young, her mother gave her this advice. Write what you know, so to make sure Rosemary's adventures were as realistic as possible. Sarah had taken French cooking classes, interned with a noted photographer, competed in a rodeo, skydived, rock climbed, scuba dived, and traveled exotic locations from the Sahara Desert to Paris to the Virgin Islands. Naturally, her family knew nothing of any of it. While her father and brother lost themselves in their computer chips, Sarah was left largely unsupervised after losing her mother to cancer. When her father made it big, she and her brother transferred to a new, exclusive school. Her classmates, however, were anything but welcoming to new money. In her old school, she endured taunting for being a nerd and a bookworm. At her new school, she was bullied for not being raised privileged and elite. There was only one person who showed any interest in her, and that was Ruth Clark, the daughter of an editor and publisher. Ruth shared Sarah's love of books and insisted on reading every Rosemary adventure. Their friendship lasted beyond high school and into college, where at Ruth's insistence, she submitted the latest Rosemary story to her father. To Sarah's surprise, he was utterly delighted with the story and drafted a contract to publish it. Not wanting to draw her family's ridicule or ire, Sarah's only condition was to publish under a pseudonym and remain anonymous. Ruth and her father were disappointed since author appearances were the backbone of any book campaign. Sarah said she could still make appearances without showing her face and wearing a wig. The idea tickled Ruth to no end, and together they created her persona. Since the story was written in first person, Sarah chose the pen name Rosemary Thomas and crafted her look to mimic the character as much as possible. Rosemary had black hair, so Sarah and Ruth shopped for a proper wig to cover Sarah's dark blonde hair. To hide her face, they found a pair of sunglasses with wide circular lens. During book tours, she wore bright red lipstick and an eclectic assortment of outfits, all found in thrift stores and second-hand shops. Ruth often said when Sarah was in character, even she had a hard time recognizing her. With the look complete and contract signed, Sarah could bask in the fruits of her labor, but also observe from the outside, safe in the knowledge, only three people on the planet knew the truth. But even Sarah hadn't realized how popular Rosemary was to become. The first book, The Foxglove Files, soared to number one, and everyone clamored for more. Her first book had been rather mundane, taking place in a New York high school, and drew upon not only her own high school experience as a student, but as her time as a substitute teacher. For Rosemary's next outing, Sarah wanted something more exotic. With six figures in her bank account from royalty checks, Sarah decided to head to Paris, exploring the city and taking classes in French cuisine, working in a bakery before making friends with the noted photographer who taught her the basics. All her research eventually inspired the Manchinial scheme. And so it began, her adventures becoming the fodder to fuel Rosemary's. Sometimes it was difficult to separate her reality from the character. Perhaps that was why when fans asked her for a love interest, Sarah responded with Edward and Rosemary's doomed romance. But did it have to be doomed? Even if she didn't have her happy ending, maybe Rosemary still could. Where did the line between fantasy and reality end. Sarah still didn't have the answer, but she kept writing, hoping one day she would find it. Chapter Two Lucas! Luke! 
Hey, Earth to Lucas. Alan practically yelled before gaining his friend's attention. Lucas ran a hand through his wavy brown hair and stared at the man in front of him. Alan had been his friend since primary school. Groomed to be an informative and indisputable researcher, Alan proved to have incomparable skills, both as a personal manager and information gatherer. Lucas could think of no one better suited to help him carry on in his grandmother's place. So far, they proved an indomitable team, securing several key wins for the benefit and expansion of the company. Perhaps he wasn't quite at his grandmother's level, and maybe he was a step or two behind the likes of Julius Delaire and Silas Prescott, but he was closing the gap. Yeah, what is it? Lucas asked, giving his friend a hard stare to remind him he was also an employee. A couple of things. Frederick Church called. Again. Alan said, noting Lucas's scowl. And what does he want? Alone? Lucas snorted back a laugh. <laughs> Is he kidding? Next time he calls, tell him I'd be a fool to help anyone who offended Augustus Delaire. He could take care of his own problems. What else? The Fortune 500 mixer is tomorrow night. Oh, that again. Lucas sighed. The mixer was a casual annual event to encourage the various elite of New York to mingle, trade ideas, and invest in new projects. He forgot who first set it up, but it was an event his grandmother never missed, so it wasn't one he could skip as her heir. The mixer itself wasn't what bothered him. What bothered him was that he would have to attend with his dull, pale excuse for a wife. Sarah Tomlinson. To this day, he didn't understand his grandmother's reasoning. Sure, she was easy enough on the eyes, but she was a schoolteacher, a substitute at that. There was simply no way she could compete with the likes of Macy Delaire, renowned photographer M. Gray, or Avalon Prescott, daughter of Emerson Carlyle and restaurant entrepreneur. If he wanted to stand on an even keel with Julius and Silas, he needed a woman capable of standing with heirs. He knew his grandmother was desperate for heirs, but there had to be a limit. Yet, his agreement with his grandmother meant he also couldn't divorce Sarah without substantial reason to satisfy his grandmother. So, he was stuck with his inadequate wife in a fast-paced world that left stragglers behind without remorse. Fine. Contact my bride and let her know the time. Lucas sighed. Alan grimaced at his callous attitude but obediently sent the message. It was several minutes before he received an answer. The wait itself was odd, but the reply, even stranger. Seeing his frown, Lucas asked, What is it? She says she's under the weather and won't be able to attend. Ah, oh, good. Lucas sighed relief. I won't have to endure her company. Luke, if she's sick enough to stay home, don't you think you should maybe take her to the hospital? She can call herself an Uber if it's that bad. Lucas waved off his concern. I'll let my sister know I'll need her to attend the mixer with me. It wouldn't do to show up stag at this event. Right. Alan's frown deepened, but he complied. He had a feeling it was going to be a very long night. Lucas stepped out of the car offering his hand and helped his sister out. Though they were a couple of years apart, they looked almost like twins. As always, Lydia wore a stunning gown, sparkling diamond necklace, and earrings and impeccable makeup. She was the epitome of heiress with an attitude and body to match. If only his bride were half as glamorous. <coughs> A voice from the limo reminded him of his other passenger. Lucas rolled his eyes but reached in to help Madeline out as well. Like Lydia, she wore a sparkling gown and a sapphire necklace. Though her family didn't have the same means as Lydia, she was seldom lacking when it came to dressing up. Though Lucas had only requested his sister, somehow Madeline managed to tag along as always. Since she was technically his secretary, he supposed there was no harm. Madeline threaded her arm through his left while Lydia took his right, and together the trio headed in with a wary Alan tagging along behind. As always, the mixer was held in a large reception room. This one had wide windows giving them a fantastic view of the city. 
The girls tagged along as Lucas made his rounds, greeting people he knew. Lucas introduced his sister and secretary to any who asked, though they were expected to remain calm and quiet and less addressed. This was a rule Sarah followed to the letter, but not one Lydia and Madeline minded breaking too much to the consternation of a few guests, some of who gave Lucas curious glances. He wasn't sure how to describe. Revulsion? Consternation? Disgust? Making his first lap of the event space, Lucas was surprised to see Julius Dallaire in attendance along with Macy. This was not their normal event. The pair usually stuck to gatherings that were more child-friendly, so they could bring along their growing brood. Though he was surprised to see them, he couldn't miss the opportunity to greet them as meeting Julius was difficult, since he spent so much of his time in Paris. Julius, good to see you. Lucas greeted. Lucas! Julius smiled, though his expression immediately became contemplative when he noticed Lucas's company. This is Lydia, my sister, and my secretary, Madeline. Charmed, I'm sure. Madeline cooed, earning a glare from Julius. Did Sarah not come with you? Macy asked, choosing not to acknowledge either young woman. Who? Oh, no. Uh, She was ill, so she stayed home. Lucas said. I hope she's all right. I was looking forward to talking with her. It feels like ages since we last chatted. Why would you want to talk to that boring hag? Lydia laughed. Is that any way to talk about your sister-in-law? Julius glared. It's not like she's anyone important. Lydia shrugged. Julius looked at Lucas, expecting him to admonish his sister, but Lucas merely shrugged. Macy frowned, sharing a concerned look with Julius before saying, Well, give her my best, and tell her I hope to see her as soon as she's well. Lucas vaguely nodded as Julius and Macy took their leave, eager to distance themselves from the unusual trio. Though Julius had entertained business proposals from Lucas in the past, He saw no reason to do so now or in the future. It was best to distance delay business interests as far from Stanton as possible, and he made a note to share his concerns with March and their father. Eventually, Lucas made it to the bar and ordered his customary drink before choosing his next route. It was going to be a long night, and he had to make the most of it, sending Lydia and Madeline off to mix with the other wives to establish wider connections. Lydia was adept at this sort of thing, so Lucas was assured she would aid his endeavours, much more so than Sarah ever could. London Bridge is falling down, down, down. Lucas sang as he stumbled outside. The only thing that kept him from walking into traffic was Alan's quick reflexes. He yanked Lucas away from the road and held him steady as he waited for the limo. When it finally arrived, he practically threw Lucas in the back before turning to the driver. Where the hell were you? Taking a leak? When I say we need the car, I mean we need it now. Sorry, sir. It's my first night. I don't want to hear excuses. Sorry. And no apologies. So, right. Um, what's wrong with Mr. Stanton? Nothing. He's just a little drunk. Look, take him home. Make sure he gets inside. I don't need him making a scene or getting arrested for indecent exposure. Got it? Yes, sir. Good. Sir, what about the women? Don't worry about them. I'll make sure they get home. Yes, sir. Ellen sighed, rubbing his temples after the driver had gone. Hopefully... He had acted quickly enough to prevent any fires from starting. He'd been wary about bringing Lydia and Madeline, and his concern was not unfounded. All night long, he listened to the gossip quietly circulating around Lucas, wondering why he'd brought his secretary of all people. If that woman is a secretary, I'll eat my shoes. One guest joked. She probably doesn't even know what a paper is, let alone a pen. The only pen she's ever handled is his, if you know what I mean. You really think so? What about his wife? Have you ever seen her? She's elegant enough, I'll give you that. 
but there's obviously no romance between them. A man's got to get his fill somehow. Nah, I suppose. Makes me feel bad for his wife. Oh, she probably doesn't have any idea. All women care about is having enough spending money to buy pretty things. How many times have you been married? Three. Seems to be a pattern, don't you think? What do you mean? Julius has only been married once, and he seems quite happy. Silas, too. Well, and I don't think the wife is as dubious as you think she is. I don't think she's sick at all. Though Lucas used the excuse of Sarah being ill, most believed it was a fabrication to keep her away from his mistress. The fact Lucas had no interest in his wife was common knowledge, and her infrequent public appearances only strengthened the assumption he was carrying on an affair. Madeline certainly didn't help matters by hanging off Lucas all night like a leech. On top of that, on top of that, many witnessed Julius's snub when Lucas first arrived, and they now considered Stanton poisonous fruit. If the Delairs weren't interested, then it was good reason to stay away. Unfortunately, that led to Lucas drinking more than usual, which led to the current results. Alan sighed. It was going to be a long week. Chapter 3 Sarah was awakened by a door slamming shut. Sitting up, she reached for a robe before cautiously stepping out of her bedroom, only to come face to face with her absentee husband. Lucas, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? He cut her off by pulling her close and passionately kissing her. His tongue invaded her mouth as his hands gripped her ass, squeezing hard. Sarah struggled to push him away, finally succeeding in breaking their kiss, though she lacked the strength to break his embrace completely. Lucas, are you drunk? Lucas, are you drunk? She asked, her nose wrinkling at the obvious smell of alcohol. Her question seemed exceedingly redundant. I'm only drunk for you, baby, he answered, picking her up. Lucas, what are you doing? Put me down. Lucas, what are you doing? Put me down. I'll put you down, all right, he grunted as they fell onto the bed together. Capturing her mouth again, he swallowed her protests, groping her body. He squeezed her breast firmly, but not painfully, before tugging off her robe in search of her skin. His forcefulness surprised her, as he always treated her coldly. But Sarah would be lying if she said she never dreamed of him touching her like this, unrestrained and lustful. Her body had never been touched before, so every caress seemed to set it on fire. Lucas mumbled as he kissed down her neck before taking her erect nipple in his mouth. Sarah moaned at the unusual sensation. She squirmed as something seemed to awaken within her, drawn out by his touch. Was she going insane? His hands slipped between her legs, fondling her thighs, before finding its way to her panties. Pushing them aside, his fingers plunged into her. Sarah yelped as he stimulated her from the inside. Pleasure and pain erupted through her as her hips grinded against his invading hand. Yeah, you like that, he mumbled. There's more where that came from, Sarah moaned her hips rocking as sweat broke out over her body. She didn't feel like she was in control as her body chased after its release, longing for more. Groaning, Lucas pulled his clothes off before stripping her and laying her bare. Her gaze widened at the sight of his engorged rod already leaking its precum. She whimpered at the thought of something so massive in sight of her but he didn't give her time to anticipate it. Mounting her, he thrust inside of her, driving his swollen member inside past barriers she didn't know existed. Sarah let out a cry at the sudden penetration, but he continued to thrust into her with an aggressive rhythm her body accommodated, and gradually, 
the pain faded somewhat. He captured her mouth again, invading it with his tongue as his rod invaded her below. Sarah moaned. Her body quivered as it neared its climax. That's right, baby. That's what you want, isn't it, Maddie? Uh, what? Sarah suddenly gasped. Luke, what did you... Her protest became a moan as he drove her to the edge before emptying himself inside her with a satisfied groan. Completely spent, he pulled out of her before collapsing across the bed in a drunken stupor. Sarah lay beside him. Her body quivered as she curled up in fetal position. Did he really call her Maddie? As in Madeline? Did he really think he was having sex with that woman instead of her? Tears blurred her vision and streamed down her face. Lucas snored in content slumber while her world crumbled under the crushing reality. The man she loved, the man who wanted nothing to do with her, had touched her for the first time, and he thought she was his mistress. Sarah forced her aching body to the bathroom, collapsing in the shower underneath the steaming water. She felt dirty and used. Was this her life? What about Rosemary? What would Rosemary do? It was a long time before she calmed. Her face was red and swollen from her already steady stream of tears, and her skin ached from her scrubbing under the hot water. But her discomfort brought her to a moment of clarity. The fantasies she nursed since her youth were only that. Fantasies. Lucas would never want her, nor care about her. He wanted another woman and he would have that woman whether he was married to Sarah or not. But she refused to play the jilted lover. This was her story, and she would write the ending any way she wanted. Shakily, she stood, turning off the water, and stepped out. Wrapped in a towel, she went to her closet, staring at the contents. It was filled with high-end designer clothes, but none of it suited her. It was all in neutral tones with the occasional addition of powder blue. She craved the warm tones of autumn and clothing with profiles that flattered her figure rather than make her look formless. Going to a dresser in the back, she found jeans and a sweater. Minding her aching body, she dressed carefully before stepping out. Quietly, she rummaged in her bedside table, grabbing her laptop phones, and charging cables, stuffing them all into the attaché. These were the only things she needed that were truly hers. Straightening, she froze as Lucas grumbled unintelligently, though she was fairly certain he said something along the lines of, yeah, you like it like that, before falling back into a rhythmic snore. Sarah stared at him, memorizing this moment. This was the last time she would ever see him. From now on, they were strangers. They meant nothing to each other. Resolutely, she pulled off her wedding bands and left them beside the lamp before walking out of the room. Leaving everything else as it was, she slipped on a pair of sneakers and stepped out of the villa. Shutting the door firmly behind her, she listened to the reassuring click the door was locked, and her keys were inside. There was no going back. She walked down the driveway, reaching the sidewalk. Turning left, she pulled out the older model phone Lucas purchased for her shortly after their wedding and turned it off. Dropping it back into her bag, she pulled off a newer phone, one she purchased for herself. Opening her Uber app, she called for a pickup at the next corner before dialing a number she knew by heart. Though it was late, she wasn't surprised when it answered on the second ring. Hey, Sarah Bear, what's up? It's not like you to call so late. Ruth, I'm coming over. I, I need to talk to you. Are you okay? 
Sounds like you've been crying. I'm fine. I'll explain everything when I get there. I'll be waiting. See you in 40. Sarah hung up as the silver-colored van pulled up to the curb and she climbed in. Lucas groaned as he stirred. Sitting up, he rubbed his forehead, fending off a headache. He glanced down somewhat, surprised to see himself nude, although it wasn't the first time he slept commando. More surprising was the beige bedding. In fact, the entire room was beige, and most certainly not his bedroom at the condo. Glancing around, he saw the other half of the bed was empty, but there was some evidence that someone had been there. Standing, he stumbled to the bathroom, needing a shower to organize his scrambled thoughts. He recalled attending the mixer with Lydia and Madeline, but after that, his memory became fuzzy and fragmented. Just how much alcohol did he imbibe to render him blackout drunk? Leaving the bathroom, he cautiously entered the closet. Only half of it was in use and filled with sensible women's clothes. Finally, he realized where he was. The villa. That meant... Lucas stepped out of the closet to stare at the bed. Slowly, he was putting things together. Clearly, Alan had noticed how much he drank and sent him home. But there must have been a miscommunication. The driver didn't bring him to his condo, but to the villa instead. A copy of the villa's keys was on his key ring, so he had access. Not that he had ever come there. In fact, the last and only time he set foot there was on his wedding night, before he left his wife on her own. That explained why he had no clothes here, and why he didn't recognize the room itself. But where was his dull little wife? Lucas frowned, eyeing the pile of clothes on the floor. Warily, he stooped, gathering it up and dumping it on the bed. He sorted out his own, but clearly there were women's clothes mixed in. He felt his anger simmer. Did she really take advantage of him while he was clearly incapacitated? Did she have no shame? He wouldn't stand for it. He found his phone, dialing Alan's number. The harried assistant answered on the first ring. I'm at the condo. Where are you, man? Where do you think? Why the hell am I at the villa? The villa? Damn. The driver was new. I told him to take you home, and he must have misunderstood. Get me some clothes and come pick me up now. I'm on my way. Lucas hung up and headed for the door, loudly declaring, if you think this is funny, I'm not laughing. Wrapped in only a towel, he reached the kitchen, but found it empty. Turning, he headed back down the hallway, checking the study and the guest rooms, finding each silent and untouched. I am not playing hide-and-seek with you, Lucas called. Get your sorry ass out here and explain yourself, Sarah. Silence returned after his voice faded. Where was she? Wasn't she supposed to be sick? Or was that some joke she concocted to make him look bad at the mixer in front of Julius DeLayer? A knock at the front door interrupted his private musing. Heading to the door, he grumbled as he unlocked the door and opened it to see Alan with bag in hand. Alan blinked, looking him up and down. Not sure this is the neighborhood you want to be answering the door naked. Switching the duffel, Lucas retreated to the bedroom to change. Alan whistled after him, amused by his friend's predicament. Closing the door, Alan glanced around the interior. It was quiet. Too quiet. Even though Sarah had been living there for three years, the villa didn't feel lived in at all. There were no pictures, no family photos, and no knickknacks. Nothing had been done to personalize the space. It was like a demo house set up for prospective buyers to see how one might use the space. Alan frowned. It just wasn't natural. 
Didn't women collect things? So, where is she? Alan asked as Lucas emerged, dressed in a suit. Damned if I know. If she's smart, she'll stay the hell away from me after last night. Why? What happened? I don't remember. That's not surprising. You were three sheets to the wind. Well, I woke up naked, in bed, alone. So, you think you and Sarah maybe... I'm not sure, but if I did, I wasn't in my right mind. I never would have touched her if I was thinking straight. Look, she's your wife. Most people have sex with their wives. It's not a big deal. That's not the point. She took advantage of me. If I end up having a kid with her, I'll never be able to convince my grandmother to let me divorce her. Okay, calm down. Look, the chances that she would conceive after one night of, you know, were a million to one, Alan said. So it's highly unlikely. Besides, would it really be that terrible? Have you seen her? She's sickly and pale. She could never raise a baby. Alan frowned. Over the past year, he certainly noticed Sarah's pale and seemingly frail demeanor. But three years ago, he remembered her being rather lively and outgoing. As far as he could tell, it was Lucas's neglect that brought her to such straits, though he hesitated to say it out loud. So what do you want me to do? Call her and make sure she gets tested. If she ends up getting pregnant, get rid of it. Lucas, that's... really? I won't have anything around tying me to that woman, Lucas declared. Now let's get to work. Alan hesitated, glancing around the villa one last time before following Lucas out. The drive to the office was awkward and silent. He wasn't looking forward to the conversation coming with Sarah, and he hoped she would stay out of sight until Lucas calmed down. Chapter 4 Two days had passed since the mixer, and Lucas fell into his usual routine. It was something Alan was grateful for. He was even happier since Lucas seemed to have forgotten his last orders, and Alan was spared an awkward conversation with Sarah about her potential pregnancy. In truth, he didn't think much of it himself. He certainly wasn't an expert on female anatomy considering he himself was gay. But he did know a woman's fertility fluctuated throughout the month. Some couples tried for years before they managed to conceive, so the chances Lucas and Sarah would after one night, while not zero, was certainly very low. In any case, the last thing he wanted to do was ask a woman about her cycles. Lucas breezed off the elevator heading to his office, only to be stopped by Sonia. Excuse me, sir? What is it? Lucas sighed. Though Madeline was his secretary, according to the company's payroll, she never came to the office to actually work. In truth, Sonia handled the actual job, which Lucas was immensely thankful for. Sonia was experienced and managed the job in expert fashion. Sir? A Mr. Taylor Reeve is here to see you. Reeve? I don't know a Reeve. Does he have an appointment? Lucas asked. Usually he didn't schedule appointments so early in the day, preferring to handle them in the afternoon. Mornings were generally spent managing any internal issues and visiting various departments. No, sir. He's been waiting for half hour now. Sonia shook her head. He says he's here to deliver some paperwork, so it will only take a minute of your time. If it's just paperwork, why didn't he leave it with you? I suggested that, but he insisted he had to deliver it to you in person. Fine. Lucas waved her away. He hated his routine interrupted, but if it was only for a minute, so be it. It wouldn't take much time to get back on track. Stepping into his office, he saw an older gentleman waiting quietly at his desk. The man was rather tall and lanky, not having the bulk around his waist that was common for middle-aged men. His hair had gone silver grey, but his gaze was sharp. 
Seeing Lucas enter, he immediately stood to greet him. Lucas avoided the handshake, noting his visitor's off-the-rack suit. Mr. Reeve, is it? That's right. Mr. Lucas Stanton, I presume. You presume correctly. Lucas circled to his chair. Have a seat. That's quite all right. I won't be here long, and I hate to take up your valuable time. Taylor reached down for his briefcase, opening it on the edge of the desk, and handed him a single sheet of paper. Sign here, please. What is this? A notice. It simply states that I am delivering this directly to you in person. With a grunt, Lucas signed, handing it back before accepting a rather thick manila envelope. And this is? Divorce papers. Taylor answered, closing his briefcase. Well, good day, Mr. Stanton. What? Lucas leapt to his feet. Is this some kind of joke? Perhaps I should introduce myself. I am Taylor Reeve, your wife's attorney. She has filed for divorce. I suggest you look over the terms carefully with your lawyer and call me if there are any questions. Gentlemen, good day. Lucas laughed. My wife wants to divorce me? On what grounds? Irreconcilable differences. Lucas doubled over. I don't know how much she's paying you for this little prank, but it's not enough. It's also my money, so technically you work for me. Actually, I'm doing this pro bono. Taylor answered without a trace of amusement. I'm a friend of the family, and I assure you it is not a prank. It is all perfectly legal and binding. My client has already signed. If you agree to the terms and sign, I can file it today if you like. Like hell. That is your choice. As I said, look over them closely with your lawyer. You have twenty days before the hearing is set. Good day to you, Mr. Stanton. Without another word, Taylor let himself out, leaving Alan to handle a fuming Lucas. Lucas. Get her on the phone right now. I want answers. Right. Alan reluctantly pulled out his phone and selected her from his contact list, as Lucas hadn't bothered to save her number in his own phone. He frowned at the response. What? Lucas noticed his expression. Why doesn't that surprise me? The woman doesn't know how to take care of anything. Don't bother, it's just a cry for attention. Lucas sighed, shoving the envelope into the garbage. Shouldn't you at least look at that? Why? The papers are probably blank. I'm telling you, this is all a prank to get my attention. But it's not going to work. All right, if you say so. Alan agreed, but he wasn't convinced. Despite Alan's misgivings, nothing more came about the strange encounter. And over the next few weeks, he put the matter out of his head, forgetting all about it as easily as Lucas. Chapter 5 Taylor Reeve adjusted his tie as he waited in front of the judge's office. He was a man of little words, but when he spoke, others knew to listen. After almost half a century in practice, he was a well-respected lawyer and rather enjoyed his work, mainly concerning himself with family court. This was certainly not his first divorce hearing, though it was much more personal, considering his client was his best friend's daughter, and a person he considered his niece. Mr. Reeves, Judge Matthews will see you now. Thanks, Janet. He stood and entered the rather small office. Normally this hearing would be conducted in a courtroom, but as the opposing party was absent, there seemed little need for theatrics. Judge Matthews stood up, offering his hand to a man he had known for almost as many years as he had practiced law, and well before he became a judge. Good to see you, Taylor. I wish it was under better circumstances. 
As do I. Well, have a seat. Judge Matthews took out his copy of the divorce agreement, reading it as he asked. So, what is this about? My client wishes to divorce her husband. Hmm. She states irreconcilable differences. Yes, he has been unfaithful. An affair? She has proof? Well, circumstantial. Here is a printout of the text messages his mistress has been sending her. Taylor offered several sheets of paper. Even as a small sample, it made for quite a stack. She also had received death threats from her husband's sister and mother. My, my. Matthews reviewed the documents with a frown. It was not the first time he witnessed such disturbing behavior between so-called elite families. Perhaps the worst example was when a father accused his own daughter of being a drug addict in an attempt to win custody of his grandchildren. But this certainly came close. Hmm. Says here she refuses all rights to property and shared assets. She's even refusing alimony. That's correct. She wants nothing. Just a divorce. Is she going to be all right? Yes, I think so, once she gets some space from him. I notice she's not here. No. She's already left the state. I assured her her presence wasn't needed for an uncontested hearing. And her husband? I delivered the papers to him myself. Here is the notice. Matthews reviewed the single sheet of paper, noting the signature before saying... And he chose not to show up, eh? Considering the split is all in his favor, I imagine he didn't see any reason to be here. Matthews nodded, setting down the papers. A family man himself, it was always hard to see a marriage end, especially on bad terms. But in this case, it was probably for the best. Ordinarily, he would have used the infidelity to rule in favor of the wife, but she had already made that decision for him. Children? None. I suppose that is a blessing. Matthew sighed. Divorces were always worse when children were involved. Your client is aware that if she changes her mind later, she will not be able to litigate any future funds from her husband with this agreement. Yes, she is aware. Well, it appears everything is in order. You are thorough as always, Taylor. We'll proceed with a no-signature divorce. You can file it today. Minus the filing and approval time, your client is a free woman. I'll put a word in with the paper pushers to put a rush on this one. Thank you. I'll give her the good news. The pair shook hands and spent the rest of their allotted time recounting fishing stories a passion they both shared. After his meeting with the judge, Taylor sat down at his desk and dialed a much-treasured number. There were several rings before it answered. Jazz music played in the background as a cheery voice answered. Hi, Uncle Taylor. Hello, Sarah. Sounds like you're having a good time. Well, it's Mardi Gras. She laughed. Is it possible not to have a good time? I've got good news. Oh? You're officially divorced. Or will be in six weeks, give or take. Oh. You okay? Yes, I'm good. And Rosemary, what about her? She'll be fine. We both will be. We always are. All right. Call me if you need anything. I will, thanks. Take care. You too. Send these down to Sam, Lucas said, handing Alan a list of specs requested by a client. Get an estimate and a timetable. Right. A knock at the door interrupted them as Sonia stepped in. 
Sir, there is a letter for you. It came certified, so I figured it was important. I'll take it. She quickly handed over the thin envelope before departing. After she had gone, Lucas looked at the return address and frowned. New York City Courts? Alan read over his shoulder. Robert didn't mention any pending legal actions, did he? Slicing it open with a letter knife, Lucas unfolded the contents to read before suddenly leaping to his feet. Notice of divorce approval? What the hell is this? Alan's mouth dropped open. It had been almost two months since their unexpected visitor, claiming to be Sarah's lawyer, and they had both forgotten about him. They remembered him at the same time. Get that damn lawyer, what's his name, on the phone, Lucas demanded. Luckily, the lawyer's name was included on the notice, saving Alan time as he entered the contact number into the office phone. Taylor Reeves' office. A rather nasally voice answered. I want to speak with Taylor immediately, Lucas demanded. Mr. Reeves is... I don't care, I want him now. Hold, please. Lucas impatiently tapped his finger on the desk. It was several moments before the line was answered. Hello, Mr. Stanton. How did you know it was me? Lucas was caught off guard, and certain he had never given his name. Stands to reason. I received my copy of the divorce approval today, so you should have it as well. What game are you playing? I don't play games, Mr. Stanton. As I told you when we first met, I'm Mrs. Stanton's, or rather the former Mrs. Stanton's, lawyer. She filed for divorce, and I simply did my job. I didn't sign those papers. Reeve answered. It's called a no-signature divorce, and it's perfectly legal and binding. If you had objections to any of our terms, you and your lawyer should have attended the hearing. Why you? I've already given Sarah the good news. She's a free woman. You and your family would do well to leave her alone to avoid any further legal action. Where is she? Lucas seethed. Client confidentiality aside, I am not obligated to tell you anything regarding her current whereabouts, Mr. Stanton, even if I knew them, which I don't. What I will tell you is that she has already left the state and has no intention of returning. You will likely never see her again. Now, I have an appointment in five minutes I have to prepare for. Good day. You son of a... Lucas cursed as the line went dead. Luke? Get Robert on the phone. I want him looking into this. Right. Lucas sat at his desk while Alan made the call. He rubbed his temples and stared at the notice, his lips curling in disgust. What the hell was going on? Was Sarah out of her mind? A few hours later, Robert arrived with a copy of the settlement in hand. Seeing Lucas's state, he paused. You look like hell! Lucas glared at him as he took a seat. You better have answers. Well, it's simple. You're divorced. If you notice my expression, I'm not laughing. Neither am I. Robert set the paperwork on the desk. Here it is, all in black and white. But I didn't even sign. You don't have to. Twenty days after you receive notice, your spouse or her lawyer can submit it to the courts. Who was her lawyer anyway? I don't know. Tyler? Thomas? Something? Reeve? Alan replied. Taylor Reeve? Robert asked. Then you're screwed. What do you mean? 
Taylor is something of a legend. He was practicing law before you and I were born. He could have become a judge ten times over by now if he wanted. Robert explained. If he submitted this, he's crossed all his T's and made sure it's rock solid. You've dealt with him before? Lucas asked. No. He handles family court cases. Divorces, custody hearings, child protection laws, that sort of thing. But I see him around now and again. A lot of people think of him as a law guru, and if they're stuck or need a new set of eyes, they ask him for a consult. He's friendly and accommodating, or so I've heard. How the hell did she get him to take her case? I don't know. He does a lot of work with charities, so maybe they met at a benefit. That's what wives do, right? Go to charity events? Alan shrugged. None of them really knew how Sarah spent her days. In fact, he was rapidly realizing none of them knew anything about her. So, how much did she get? Lucas sighed. Nothing. What? Lucas asked. Nothing. Zero. Nada. Zip. Zilch. Robert said. She didn't take any assets, property, or stocks. She even declined alimony, now and in the future. So if she changes her mind later, she can't sue you for a cent. Lucas frowned. Why did she make that clause? Was it a mistake? Reeve wouldn't make a blunder like that. It's probably why the judge accepted it so easily. But why? She's a substitute teacher, for God's sake. Why would she leave with nothing? Why are you asking me? Robert threw up his hands. You were the one married to her. You mean to tell me you were married to a woman for three years and you know nothing about her? Lucas opened his mouth to argue, but snapped it shut. He really didn't have any way to retort, since he truly didn't know anything about the woman he married. Look, I don't see the problem. I mean, you were planning to divorce her as soon as you could convince your grandmother to let you. She said you couldn't divorce her, never said anything about her divorcing you. Robert stood. I gotta go. Call me if she does try crawling back. With a wave, he departed leaving Lucas with a stack of papers detailing his failed marriage. He just couldn't understand it. Luke? Why did she leave? Luke, maybe... No word, no message, nothing to help him understand. Find her. What? Maybe what? Lucas glared at him. I don't care how, just find her. Her brother still works here, right? Yeah. Monitor his phone and email. That's illegal. I don't care. He has to talk to his sister occasionally. Just do it. Okay, all right. I'll do my best. Alan sighed, wondering where to start. So concerned with how... He never recalled their original concern from months ago. Was she pregnant? <laughs>